Let's go. Um, let me, let me, let's just go. Welcome to Firecat First Friday. I'm Susan Price. I'm the CEO of Firecat Studio. We are a user experience consultancy based in San Antonio, Texas. We do websites, anything digital, uh, the design, designing experiences, and we do user research and usability for all, kind, all sizes of customers from uh, small startups to giant enterprises and government and nonprofit. And today I have invited my dear friend, Jennifer Navarrete. Jennifer, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, Susan, thanks for having me here. I love the Firecat community and, and Susan and all the stuff that she's done over the many, many years that she's been hosting these first Friday Firecat events. We've gone virtual, but you know what? That allows us to expand beyond a zip code, and I absolutely love that we can do this. So I am Jennifer Navarrete. I am an early adopter. I'm a pioneer. I am a chaser of shiny objects, which you will hear about today. I first began podcasting in 2005, developed my first community, hosted events beginning in 2000. 2007 within the podcasting and social media space. And this thing, this curiosity to learn about things, to do the learn, share, grow, which is the motto that was popularized by Social Media Club, of which I was a chapter head. Um, we, I look at this as the way that I look at life, that when I look at something that piques my interest, I want to learn about it. And as I learn about it, I want to share what I'm learning. And in that way, we can all grow together. Um, and you'll hear more about that. But in my mind, this opportunity for us here today to share, to demystify the blockchain is another one of those learn share opportunities so that we can grow. Yep. So um, let's try to get a level set in the chat. Why don't you tell me what you think the blockchain is? Do you already know? Do you have a sense of what what's important about it? Or do you want us to just go right to the, let to me the give a qualifier. 411? Yeah, let me give a qualifier. When I, Jennifer, talk about the blockchain in this discussion and pretty much in any discussion you're ever going to hear me for listening to my podcast, listening to me speak. It's all about this context in relation to the blockchain, the blockchain as a content creation destination, period. In other words, the same types of behaviors that you're doing on Twitter, because Twitter is a content destination for you. you're creating content, you're putting it on Twitter. That's a destination. You're doing that on Facebook. You're doing it on Instagram. You're doing it on YouTube. You're doing it on Twitch. Insert name of whatever platform that you're doing this already. I am simply challenging all of us to consider the blockchain as a content creation destination. So in regards to this topic today, it is only about that. It is not about cryptocurrency, although there is cryptocurrency involved in a reward system because of the content you create, but it is not the focus of it per se. So we're not talking about that. We're not talking about creating DAOs. We're not talking about developing dApps. None of that stuff. We're only- All right, at all right. So hold on, hold on. I've already overwhelmed. You're, it's you time are, to go. You're, you're, you're fire hosing just a little bit. So I'm, my, my role in here, Jennifer is a force of nature and she gets really excited and I'm going to stop and slow down the conversation. Uh, Mario says he has only heard of it, don't know much. So thank you for being transparent about that, Mario. Um, I've been watching this for a while, the blockchain. It, it is a technology. I'm gonna give you my dumbed down impression, okay? Been interested in blockchain, can be used to denote true origin or ownership of things like art. Yes. Okay. Um, let me let me just take a stab at giving you my simplistic view of things. If I wanted to send money to Jennifer, one way would be that I use a bank or PayPal or some trusted intermediary. I send that intermediary the money and then they send Jennifer the money. That's, that's the usual way that, we that we're used to thinking of it. But in a blockchain, there is this um, worldwide encrypted ledger of agreements between people. So Jennifer and I agree, I'm gonna send her $20 US. And we, we can do that on the blockchain that is a distributed electronic ledger that is safe and permanent in a sense. It is also distributed. There are copies of it all over the world. So if we make an agreement that I'm going to send her a certain amount of money, or we make a contract, or we make any other type of agreement, then the, the, this is recorded in such a way that everybody 
can see that that has happened. And we are verifiably the owners of this transaction. There's no middle person. It's also can be private. It's tied to a, an address that I control. Is this square with what you think it is, Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, it is. There's a lot, a lot of more nuances to that. But as an overview, I'd say you hit it on the head. Okay. So also, one of the things we worry about, especially with money, is that it's hackable, right? That the, some bad actor can go in and clean out your bank account, or they can, you know, take over your whatever, your content, you know, uh, whatever. They, they can, they can steal your account. Absolutely. They can steal and things from you. And the, the encryption of the blockchain is really important. And the fact that it is distributed, there are copies of it all over the place and, and verified. The, it's like a sweater. If you think about a knitted sweater, if you try to pull one of them, it's a chain of, of transactions or records. And if you try to mess with one, it's like it, a pull in a sweater. It's very obvious that that has been messed with. And there are other un, uh, Untampered with. adulterated versions of the ledger for people to find and see. Mm -hmm. To verify. Right. right. So the blockchain, a lot of people think of the blockchain and cryptocurrency as kind of the same thing because cryptocurrency wouldn't exist without a technology like the blockchain to be based on. Because what you need is this party and this party have an agreement that is recorded that everybody can trust and rely on. Yeah, that everybody can see. So there's no, no uh, nothing, I mean, nothing that untoward should happen, although it does, right? There's every, so there's bad actors, you mentioned that. What I want to throw in here and that I get a lot of pushback on when I try and talk about blockchain as a content creation destination, and you mentioned that there can be bad actors and people can steal your keys and the keys to your wallet, right? So that's another thing to consider. And that proves ownership and allows you to have the ability to post and to collect rewards and to distribute rewards on any particular blockchain. There's not one wallet, there's not one blockchain, there's many. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, as in, we're grownups here, right? We're adults. If you do not take care of your keys and you are willy nilly with it and you share it and someone takes it and they now own your account. You don't own your account anymore. And there isn't anyone to go complain to. There isn't a principal, there isn't a custodian, there isn't a teacher, there isn't anybody for you to go to complain to because you're responsible for your keys and for keeping them secure and safe. So you'll hear that stressed a lot. And there's a reason for it. That's one reason why people are a little bit intimidated by this space because of the fact that we have to be grown-ups and be responsible for our own stuff. And we don't yeah. have anybody that we can go have recourse with. You hear about people getting rugged, you know, getting the rug pulled out from under them because they trusted someone and they did something and now all of a sudden they were wiped out. You, yes, you have to be cautious, but that's not just in Web3. That's not just on the blockchain. If you get an email from somebody from some country that says, if you send me $10,000, I'll send you a million dollars. Do you do it? No. And if you did and you got ripped off, whose fault is it? Yours for, you know, being gullible. Um, this happened in Web1. It happens in the real world. People can, people scam other people in the real world. So it's not unique to web three. Okay. But let's give it hey, pause, <laughs> pause. All right. The three levels of web web one. How do you, how do you describe uh, web 1.0? Okay. I will give you the meme that I found that explains this so well, as far as my understanding goes. And it just made sense to me. Web one talking about AOL days, right? Or the nineties in my mind, right? The nineties of the web when AOL was the place where those of us in the U S went and got content. So it was companies making content, AOL and companies making money, AOL and other companies like that. I'm just using them as an example. They weren't the mm -hmm. only ones out there. Web two, the space that we find ourselves in today is that users, you and me, we make the content, right? We make the content companies make the money. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't make content, can't make money. We absolutely can. We can grow an audience. We can develop a brand. We can sell courses and products. We can eventually get there. And if you're someone who's a YouTuber and you have a thousand subscribers and you also have 4,000 watched hours within the last 12 months, you can qualify for their partner program. And then you can begin to make money. But please don't, don't forget that that whole time that you were building up your brand, 
YouTube was making money on your content, not you. So Web 2, users, you and me, make the content, companies make the money. Web 3, users, you and me, make the content, users, you and me, make the money, period. We also own it. And that, to me, explains the difference between Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3 in ownership and in, in monetization. It's very, very simple. Is it overly simplistic? Yeah. But those are the basics because when you create content on the blockchain, you own it. Right now you think, well, don't I own the stuff I made on Twitter or don't I own the stuff I made on Facebook? Um, ask someone who's been deplatformed whether they owned their stuff. Or uh, it, ask yourself if you read those terms and conditions. Right. They know we're not reading the terms and conditions. We all just say, I agree, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you could wake up tomorrow and Facebook could take your group that you have and say, you violated our terms of service and now your group is gone. You spent years developing that group, that business page, your personal profile and, and developing that network and getting and all of a sudden it's gone and you had no say about it. So you don't own anything that's on Web2 at all. Now, it's not a one way street. It's not like as if, oh, they're the terrible guys. Hello, they're giving us a platform to connect, to build our brands, to sell courses, to do things. It is a give and take. But at the end of the day, at really at the end of the day, he who holds the keys, right, owns everything or he who has the gold makes the rules. And that's true. So on the blockchain, you own what's there. You're part owner if you participate in that space. And you are also, no one can take what you have said away. No one can remove it. Now they can downvote it if they don't like what you've said, but it can never be taken away because it's distributed across a peer-to-peer -peer network across the world. And it can't be like, you know, your account cannot be non-account. It'll always be there. Can we, can we dive in a little bit into your journey from web one I imagine you were an early adopter, even oh, yeah. Web1, right? Uh, 2,400 baud modems, 9,600 baud modems, 14.4. 14, 14, yeah. I mean, when it was 24.4, it was like, oh, blazing speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then uh, what, when you and I met, it was right at the beginning of Web2-ish. Now, these, these things are artificial boundaries, right? Sure. It's always a continuum. It's, it's you know, changing all the time. And we have these artificial, kind of like the Jurassic era is just somebody's idea yeah just it to try like to get there was a line work right yeah, so yeah. it's it's kind of bs but it, at the beginning of when web 2 was starting to be a thing when social media was starting to be a thing um i've heard web 1 described as one way broadcast and web 2 being two way dialogue which is mm -hmm. interesting but from the very beginning blogs had comments so yeah. I, I didn't find that to be as, as useful as the thing you just told me about ownership. That's a much better way of thinking about it. But you and I met right at the kind of point where we were moving from web one into web two, and we both got really excited about social media. And I think everybody on this call is, is with me. Uh, we, we got excited about the ability to share our thoughts. And the other thing that is really important about Web 2 is that dialogue, because in Web 1, if you knew a lot of tech and you sort of strapped in and decided you were going to figure it out, you could have a, a web server and publish <laughs> web pages, right? Yes. And then that got easier, like the, the barrier to entry re, re, uh, went down. And then in web two, one of the really important things was brands were shocked that now users could have a say. We could have Yelp, we could have you know reviews of things and we could go on to Google and tell people, I had a terrible experience with this doctor. Mm -hmm. Or in you the know? case of uh, Foursquare, we could be the mayor of their business. Right, <laughs> Foursquare, <laughs> I haven't heard that in what? A long eight time. Years, eight mm -hmm. years. Um, so anyway, that, that my career, I've seen there is a steady empowerment of the individual, which I, as someone who loves democracy and individual rights, thinks a great thing, but there are some risks with it. And we're having to take more responsibility for what we build and what we say. So it, do you think that that's right? That web three is a is a continuation of empowering individuals? 
Yeah, most definitely. I, I think you you kind of illustrated it really well because it really does come to where we have more ownership, more um, ability to have a say in what goes on. Because right now, um, when Facebook does something, we don't have a say. We just have to, and, and they're losing a lot of market share and a lot of money right now for many reasons. But one of the things is that we've been, as users, we've been telling them what we want and what we don't like, and they haven't listened. They're just like, ah, you don't know what you want. We're going to do what's good for us. And so now they're starting to reap the the, the rewards or reap, <laughs> reap the whirlwind on some of that. I, on the blockchain, because you are part owner of that blockchain, you have a vote. Everyone has a vote. And you can vote for what's called witnesses, meaning people who kind of help the blockchain run. They have the servers that are distributed around the world and they help guide some of that. But if you don't like what's happening, you can actually vote against something. And it's very, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an interesting thing to kind of watch happen and to be part of and, and to just watch everyone nurture and grow because it's for the best of everyone if this grows well. And then you see other blockchains where it implodes on itself because the witnesses were not good stewards of the blockchain and the people who were participating didn't really care and didn't really have their voice, uh, didn't share their voice. And I've seen some of those on on many sides. So um, when I talk about blockchain, please know I'm not talking about one. There's many and all of them have their own nuances and they have their own ways and communities. They have their own communities. So doing the research and you hear this all the time. You're going to hear this from everyone who talks about what you're going to hear it from me. Do your own research and due diligence. The fact is no one knows where, what that is and where do we start? Do we believe all the hype that's on Twitter where NFTs are everything? And do we believe all the hype that this, I mean, yes and no. Okay. We need Hang on. Pause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> NFT non fungible token token. And that is a bit of content. It can be visual content. It can be any kind of electronic version of something, mm -hmm. but that you can't replicate it, right? Or you can have a series. <clears throat> so the way that I understood it, so I was in the few months ago, I was like, gosh, I kind of get NFT, but I don't really get NFT. And Lucas Bean, he is at LUC360 on Twitter, has an NFT 101 course. It's free short little videos, short, like, I don't know, two to maybe six minutes. And there's uh, maybe 13, 14 of them, but they're short. And it really goes through what it is, why it has value. And, and it goes through how to mint, you know, how to buy, how to auction, how to sell, all that kind of stuff. And it was a really good little primer for me to have an, an understanding and an appreciation for the NFT space. And I all of a sudden understood why artists were so jazzed about it because for the first time, they were really able to benefit from their creative works in a way that they have not but ever. Yes. Okay, ever. so let's give another, uh, I love concrete examples. I think they help people understand. Yeah. So an, an example of uh, an artist, I, if I go down to First Friday at Blue Star, I can buy directly from the artist. I give them my money. We don't have a middle person. And an NFT is a way for them to sell me their art, even if they live in Bali or Australia or Argentina, right? I can buy their art and they, they control my access to their art. No middle person. And the, the fact that I bought it and now own it is recorded in a blockchain so that it can't be challenged. I own this thing. Um, I struggled for a while worrying about, well, if it's digital stuff, what keeps people from just making copies of, of it? Um, it? Nothing keeps people from making copies, but what we have is that record that I'm the person who actually owns the real thing. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the examples I heard that, that helped a piece of this click into place for me is postage stamps. Postage stamps, there is one government entity in the U.S. that can print postage stamps and di di uh, distribute. distribute, sell postage stamps. And we all accept that that's a thing and that, you know, they have value. But really, anybody could print postage stamps or money. There's nothing <laughs> preventing this from happening except social kind of constructs and law. And it's against the law. <laughs> right. So the, the whole idea that, well, we can't do NFTs because they're replicable. No, there's fake art. There's fake, you know, there's, you know, people pirate software and there's always going to be that. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it occurred to me that the the musicians have gone through this during the Napster years because they were in a system where they were having to to pay a big daddy to the the big lab, record labels distributors like Columbia and whatnot. They had to pay them and and sort of be enthralled to them and be under their control and their thumb in order to get distribution. And, and then Napster happened and it was just like, oh no, <laughs> the cat was out of the bag. And, and that got clamped down by the legal system. But with blockchain, it's the same thing as you're describing with artists. They can decide how they distribute and to whom they distribute. And we as buyers of their art or patrons have that record that can prove our ownership, right? Yeah, and I think the really nice extra thing about NFT that doesn't exist in the physical art space is that as an artist, if um, that person that you bought it from, from Bali, sells you their piece, they can also continue to be rewarded when you sell it again. Right now, if we look at Pablo Picasso, when he sold whatever art pieces he sold, he made the money one time. Obviously, we know that Picassos are worth much, much more than what he sold them for. And yet his, he and his estate have never benefited a single dime from that increase in value. Whereas with NFTs, when it get, changes owners and there's an increase, then you the, the artist can get whatever the percentage that's built into the, the minting. But they so get to decide what that contractual yeah. percentage is. So, and it's so part of the offer for an NFT. True. And so let's say you bought one for $100 and then now you're selling it for $200. They don't get to get the reward from the original $100, but they do get to get their 10% reward over the, or whatever, 20%, whatever they decided within the contract. Um, they do get to get that same percentage of the increase in value in perpetuity. And so that to me is really where the extra power is for artists is that it's not a one and done. It, as their art continues to increase in value, they continue to reap the rewards of that increase based on the percentage that they allocated inside of the contract. Let's back up a minute and talk about how Wild West things are right now in Web3. Because Darling is asking really good questions about where would I start if I wanted to begin to dig in? And in order to get there, I want you to set the context of it's a bit of a Wild West ride right now. It's, it's Wild West for sure. So if we think about the Wild West, and when I talk about the Wild West, I'm talking about the United States, right? Because for the rest of the world, they're like, I'm not sure what that means. But in the context of this happening in the U.S., the Wild West was an amazing opportunity. It was chart your own path. You know, it was, it was stake your claim. It was all these wonderful things that you could be who you wanted to be and build what you wanted to build because there was no one to stop you. So that is definitely true on the blockchain. However... There was also, you know, robbers who could who could rob you. You could die on the Oregon Trail. I mean, the Wild West was not all, you know, sunshine and flowers. So there, while it is a lot of opportunity, there is also a lot of things that could go wrong. So be mindful of that. That, and this is something that you, you'll hear me say often: don't leave your common sense at the Web 3.0 door. I'm seeing this happen a lot where people are getting excited by, you know, NFTs, let's say, you know, the, everybody's talking about NFT and people are making it rich in NFTs. And so they just throw their money and put their trust in something they have no idea about because they haven't done their research and their due diligence because they're getting swept away by what they think they're missing the boat. Let me tell you something, folks, if you're in this session right now with Susan and I, you are an early adopter. And you may be thinking, how can I be an early adopter? People have doing, been doing this for a few years now. The mainstream has not is not here yet, and they won't be here for probably the next, I don't know, two, three, four, five years. You are an early adopter. Please remove the pressure that you have on yourself to have to hurry, hurry, hurry on this. There's a whole lot of time to do it. Take your time. It's worth to take the time to learn. You're here because you want to learn more. You're starting your research, and you're starting to do your own due diligence. This is a good first step. There's a lot of other places to go, but take the time to learn. Get connected with folks that you know that are in this space. Um, Susan and I and others that you know are doing this and learn along with us. Take some courses, you know, read a book, you know, join some of the Twitter spaces, join some of the LinkedIn lives of people talking about the stuff. But don't just automatically assume that everything that you're hearing is 100%. Right now, what I'm sharing with you is what I, me, know to be true based on my experience over the last year. 
Right. That's so I don't know everything. I cannot know everything. I cannot know every situation, but I can tell you what I have experienced and what I know. And I think the more of us that gather together and learn together and share together, we will all grow together. So take your time. There's plenty of time. Believe me. Okay. So uh, Darling asked, is there a Facebook or Twitter type app that is content based on the blockchain? Yeah, so and, much. And there are many different choices. It, Lots. it remains to be seen which ones, which ones, I think multiples of them will survive and thrive. And different ones have different groups of community, hmm. right? Depends on who started it, depends on what their principles and ethics and you know, foundational statements are, depends on who comes and has an influence. So it's all very much. Uh, it's early. It is early, so early. days. Right. It's but so so, give, so, give an example. Let's, let's go into your story. Yeah. How you became aware of this, like that, that social media content was happening on the blockchain. How did you figure that out? In August of 2017, I was speaking at an entrepreneur conference. And at that conference was a gentleman called Michael, Tag Michael Taggart, who had been in blockchain for years. And he talked about many things, but one of the things that he talked about that really piqued my interest was he said, you can, you can blog on the blockchain and people can pay you for blogging. And I was like, I mean, I'd been blogging for years by then. <laughs> no one was paying me to blog. And I thought, that's really interesting. Okay. And, and so I went and checked it out and I created an account and wrote four blog posts and got maybe 12 cents. And I was like, meh. And I walked away. Three years later, last year in March, Shane Mata, my good friend, someone that we all know. And if you're in San Antonio, you probably know Shane. He contacted me and said, hey, I've been doing this thing for the last couple of years and I really think it's time for you to take a look at this. And I was like, okay. And he kind of gave me a little bit of rundown and I was like, oh, this kind of sounds familiar. I've, I've heard of this kind of stuff before. At 12 said, cents. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right. So then he, uh, uh, and I said, well, I don't want to do this by myself. I said, is it okay if, cause I said, I want you to give a training session. And I said, is it okay if I bring my family on this? And he said, sure. So I scheduled a training session with him and he gave me, gave us like a two hour. I mean, you think I fire hose? Oh no. Uh, <laughs> Shane, but Shane fire hoses with, with like the technical details. And, and I, after an hour, my brain was mush and you know me, I'm pretty, I can handle stuff. I was, I finally told him, I, I, I cannot take anymore. I need to process what you just told me. I don't think I understood a third of what you said. Maybe if I'm lucky, but I took a lot of notes. We recorded the session and he said, and he said, well, I'm here for you when you want to do it. So my family and I had a discussion and we joined, we, we said, okay, he sent us a referral link. Cause he's the one who's on board. To one to be of these spaces many, where, these many blockchains. where social media exchanges right. occur. Right. So this is where this I'm, I'm getting there, but it's kind of, it's a long story because I want you to know it wasn't this, I didn't get it at first, you know, years later, here I am. And he shows it to me and I'm like, holy cow, I get this there. He showed me a particular blockchain where they had a micro blog. What's a micro blog? Twitter, but they have a version of that on the blockchain, not Twitter, but another entity. And then there was things like blogs on there. And there was things like Facebook and there was things like Instagram and there was things like YouTube. There were every single thing that you could think of that exists gaming. on web two gaming, virtual That's reality. Like, right. Uh, right. All those things were on uh, various blockchains, this one included. And I was like, duh, this is so a uh, duh. I'm already posting things here. So the big V8 moment for me, I did that in March of last year. So it's been a year and I kind of would post every once in a while and I'd get a few pennies and I'd post in the one in a while and I do here, I wasn't fully committed. And then I started listening to um, Adam Curry and Dave Jones talking about podcasting 2.0 in April and of last year. And if anyone knows me in podcasting, I'm e-podcaster. There's a reason for that. Um, it piqued my interest. They were building the next generation of podcasting on the blockchain. And they were including the value for value model, which means that there's a built-in reward system within an RSS feed. Now, I don't want to get lost in that, but that got me thinking, oh, wait, this thing that Shane just showed me, I probably need to go, you know, be a little bit more serious with it. And I kept listening to the podcast and I totally understood very little of what they said, but the little bit I understood, I could get that the future of podcasting and in, and in my mind, content creation was on the blockchain. So in July, on July 4th, 
I was kicking it around, kicking it around, and I thought I should, the way that I learn is by doing. So I, I thought, I'm going to see if I can buy a domain and create a show. So I found CryptoContentCreators.com, and I called, as soon as I bought it on GoDaddy, I called Shane, and I said, Shane, I just bought this domain. Would you like to do a show with me? And he said, sure, why not? And that was July 4th. On July 7th, we recorded our first episode. And we have, uh, I think, five episodes, five or six episodes out for season one. I've recorded two episodes for season two. I have not put them out yet. But that got me going. I learned by doing and by sharing and by growing. But when Shane and I created the crypto content creators, we didn't create it for free. We created it on the blockchain in order to be rewarded by the blockchain. And we have been. And that also got me going, ooh, this is really awesome because now people – who like our content are, are giving us rewards. They're, they're saying they like it. So then in November, I do national podcast post month, which this past November was year 14, but I thought I'm going to take that to the blockchain. <laughs> so I created a community on the blockchain and took Napod Pomo there. I only had five people join me. I mean, I had the regular people on web two join me that have joined me for 14 years, but just as something new, and guess what? Every single post, every single episode, my 30 episodes that I created on the blockchain, I was rewarded for. I have never, ever, ever been paid for any of the Napod Pomo episodes I've done for the 14 years. And yet just by putting the content on the blockchain, I made a reward. And so those are the kind of things that continue to cement this experience that I'm having and why I am on a quest to demystify the blockchain. Okay, so... Did you put a con like did you put a value on the information that you were sharing? And that's why you made money? Can you describe the the money model there? Sure. So when I create a post on Twitter, and here's the example I can give you, because a real world example. In July, when I started really going more further into the blockchain with Shane, I started thought I should do some A B split test. So I was baking bread in the summer. Why? I don't know. I went through a crazy bread baking stage and I was taking photos of the bread and I'd made a collage photo of the dough and of the bread and of it sliced. And I put it on Twitter and I put it on the blockchain. And at the time on the blockchain, I had nine followers. And at the time on Twitter, I had 5,000 followers. On Twitter, I got three little hearts. I was like, mm, okay, cool. On the blockchain, I got 11 upvotes and made 88 cents. Now, that 88 cents is not all mine because on the blockchain, you don't just get rewarded for creating content. You also get rewarded for engaging with content. That's called curation. So I get half of that and the rest of it goes to the curators, all the people who upvoted, who commented, who liked, who shared. That engagement has a value to not just me, but to the folks who actually do the engaging. So it's a win all the way around and it's this frictionless way to reward this thing that we do on web two all the time and so looking at this for free think, and then we're enriching twitter or facebook right. or yeah Bellin exactly Bellin. right so if we look at the four let's just take the 44 cents in theory right the 44 cents that i earned on an account that had nine followers so on that account 44 cents you may think that's not a lot of money jennifer mm, you're right it's not a lot of money but on twitter where i had 5,000 followers at the time i had i'm now past that but at the time i had done 45,000 tweets. So now let's do the math on 44 cents times 45,000 tweets. It starts to change how you look at the content that you're creating. It's your content, it's your creation, but who's really being rewarded out of this? Now, again, not this is not a selfless endeavor on, on the blockchain. Everyone gets rewarded. It's fractions of a fraction of a fraction, but hey, that stuff adds up over time. And the time is on our side because it's early adopter time. So you would have, just like it's better that you start saving when you're right out of college and so that it has longer to grow. We're at an early point. You can establish a reputation. You start your growth curve now rather than wait until you know the masses are jumping in. Same, same reason I think both of us benefited from being early adopters of Twitter because it was a lot less crowded and noisy when we adopted. That's part of the reason we have as many followers as we do, is my mm -hmm. theory. Well, and the followers too, it's, it's not about numbers, by the way. It's always about quality over quantity any day of the week. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll agree with that in, in many ways. I think one of the other things to consider is that when you're building your uh, 
yourself on this new place because right now you're starting with nobody like nobody knows who you are and it's a little bit daunting to go into a space that you don't necessarily know all the technical and all of the the norms and all the nuances and the way that things work it can be a little bit like ooh, I'm the new kid on the block people are gonna what if people are mean people aren't mean now people can be mean but I haven't experienced that personally and I feel like if you're just who you are in general you're gonna find your people you're gonna find your tribe your community but I will say when you join the blockchain it is always better to join with friends because it is you're learning the, the landscape together and the challenge also, you're shaping the landscape together so time. you want to shape it with people who share your values and your principles and your goals yeah and you want to have fun I mean, so when Shane brought me and my family on, it wasn't just, you know, me doing it. It was, you know, Jordan doing it. It was Jackie doing it. It was, you know, we were kind of like, hey, you know, I wrote a post. And so then we would go upvote each other's posts. And granted, at the beginning, because you're starting brand new, the vote value that you have, the upvote value is like 0 0.001 of a penny. But eventually, as you build up and you build up, eventually it, grow, it, it grows. I mean, right now, my, I, again, I'm, I've, uh, I'm probably like at a... Mm, the, the, the token that this blockchain is, is on, when I started, I want to say the value of a single token was like maybe 77 cents US. And then in, in November, it went up to like $3. And now it's like at a dollar again. So it's, it's anything else. It fluctuates just like crypto fluctuates. I wouldn't, I'm not going to, you know, this isn't something I'm going to go pay my mortgage on right now. But I do know that people who were on various blockchains like two, three years ago, some of those folks have quit work. And they're living off of their the stuff that they're creating on the blockchain. I'm like, wow. I mean, being early is definitely a good thing, but it, we're still early. I can tell you, we're still early. Okay. So, um, are you guys? Do any of you want to come on and ask some of your questions, or do you want me to read them out from the chat? Yeah, and I can also sh screen share some stuff if you guys want to look at some. Things. I, I think it's. I think they're ready for us to get specific. When you say. I'm on a blockchain. Which one are you talking about? And how did you get there? I'm talking about a lot of things. I'll show you one. And then I'll show you one that I just joined because I want you to see it from the beginner's perspective. And let me share my screen. And guys, if you want to come on up, feel free. Shelly can come on. She's got a list of questions. Nice. Chris, can, okay. you, can you promote Shelly for us? OK, so here's one that I just joined recently. I'm not on the account that I'm logged in. This is just me. Um, and so if you look at my wallet, which is here, uh, my wallet's worth like $4.88. And their token on this blockchain is worth 0 0.031. So three cents for one of their tokens. And you can see the history of everything that I've done here. You know, so I just started recently. I have this, I've only been on this for what? It says two months. I haven't been on here very long. But you start somewhere, right? You start with nothing. And so this is what the vote values are worth, or this is what my account is. And if I come back over here, you can see what I've talked about. And this, Susan, you were talking about this, the way that we transfer value to one another. In this case, there was um, the um, Random Acts of Kindness Day, which was, I think, last month. Uh, yeah, it was last month. There was a, a campaign on this blockchain to give just to any random person some, some what, what in the, the token, which is in this case is called Blurt. And it was just like, just send it to random people and then you can post about it. And so I thought, cool. So I found someone, this person I don't know who lives in Africa, who started a new account. I just went to new accounts and people who were introducing themselves. And I just sent her 10 tokens and just put happy random acts of kindness and welcome to Blurt. Cheers. So this all happened within the blockchain. And now she has those 10 tokens from me. And then I said, taking a moment to share my random acts of kindness experience. And if I click on this, I gave credit to where it says special thanks to this person and this person for your random and generous acts of kindness. Because they sent me, they sent me tokens. They each sent me 10. And I thought that is awesome. So here it was, somebody sent me 10 and somebody else sent me 10. And I mm -hmm. thought that's really awesome. And I thought um, it was fun to be a part of this event and also to read what others were doing. So then by me posting that, I was upvoted by two people and it's these two people right here and they this person voted me 100 percent. this person gave me 5.3 percent you can decide what the upvote is worth whether you want to give 100 percent of your upvote or one percent or five percent or whatever and so it equaled out to 16.32 blurt which was worth 26 cents great fine I mean, the other blockchains started out similar and then they go up to dollars and then all of a sudden this becomes something more meaningful. But for me, not having put any money into this at all, 
at all. Just just creating content. Oh, no, I guess it went down. It's I've got like a little under five dollars of value, even though all I've done is just write these posts right here. So here was one. You can see I don't write in here very often. I shared a post. Um, here was one for me. I made 72 blurt and it was worth a dollar 18. Right here was a share post I shared. What's so special? Here's another one I made 89 cents. Here I didn't make anything on this one. So if people don't find value in what you write, guess what? You don't get value. So it encourages good content and good stewardship of content. And my introduction post, okay, it was three months ago. Um, I wound up getting uh, 115 blurt that was worth 183. Remember, I don't get all of this. I get half and the people who upvoted me get to split the balance and then a tiny bit goes to the blockchain. So does this kind of help give you a sense of why this is just really similar to what we're doing already? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got questions. Go. Um, let's see. And I'm just from from start to finish. So, is blockchain content forever? Yep. For as long as there are um, computers to power the internet, the answer would be yes. And okay. it has to, yeah, because it's all over the world. It's distributed across the planet. It's not like forever. Like Foursquare content was forever, right? Like. <laughs> That's my question is, what if Blurt disappears? What do you, how do you, how do you continue to use that content, monetize that content, work with it, right? So what happens is things don't really disappear like that. Um, Blurt is actually a fork off of Steemit. So Steemit um, went through, that's one of the blockchains that I'm telling you that is imploding on itself. <laughs> and so what happens is, is when people don't like what's there, Mm -hmm. then they will fork over <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> they will take the copy of what's there and they will create their own blockchain. And it's all gotcha. your stuff that was there goes with you. Gotcha. So it's, I'm thinking of it like a one to many distribution model, but really it's just like, it's everywhere and it's just existing elsewhere at the same time. So if you go elsewhere, it's with you. That makes sense. Yeah, and then, yeah. um, Let's see, can you, I'm thinking of it in terms of like, um, I have blogs that I wrote back when I was working for a Southwest School of Art that are gone. <laughs> They're just gone. Um, if, if I were to have that opportunity now, would it be the same as like, instead of selling that content over licensing it? And can you retract the license from something you know, on the blockchain to use it? Uh, hmm, that sounds kind of, that may be beyond my pay grade. <laughs> I can definitely find the answer to that because I, I'm connected with people who have been in this space a lot longer than me. And you know, the real person that could answer that is Shane. If you ever read any of Shane's works, he writes these long, long detailed posts about something he's looking at. And it takes me a while to get through them because it's very, very detailed, but I am always learning from him. He is amazing. And he's, so Shane is really into decentralized finance, DeFi. If you've ever heard DeFi, it's decentralized finance. And what Susan said about taking out the middleman, um, there's a way that, there's a way to do every single kind of financing that you do in the real world. There's a way to do it on the blockchain, various blockchains. And one of the things that I recently discovered that I think is kind of fascinating is there's something called, um, NFT Phi. And what it does is that you, if you're someone who's bought a lot of NFTs and there's a lot of value in it, but you don't want to sell your NFTs, but you'd like some money, you can take your NFT wallet and, and submit it to NFT Phi and someone will come and loan you money against your art. So it's still your art. You still own it collateral and you can then use that money to live or to invest or to do whatever of course you need to pay it back so but it's from person to person and not from this bank allowing you to qualify because it's not you who's qualifying it's the art the quality of the wallet and it has nothing this has zero to do with you it's about the assets that you own and that's just one to me very innovative and creative way for peer to peer to have this really amazing value for value model because you bought NFTs and they're valuable. You want to own them. You don't want to sell them. You know, they're going to go up in value, but yet you're like, I could use some cash. Well, Hey, somebody wants to loan you money on those NFTs. Now, granted, if you default, just like a regular loan, then you lose your NFTs, but you shouldn't do that. You know, and then there's ways to, uh, 
I'm telling you, follow Shane. His stuff okay. is crazy, <laughs> amazing. And if you like to get nitty gritty, and if you're especially interested in the DeFi aspect, he's going deep, deep into it. And it's a fascinating journey to kind of follow. Awesome. I It would be really interesting to see, you know, bloggers being able to license content through blockchain to different companies as bigger companies start pulling this on board and using their blog posts, for example, in their content streams, um, just to see that ability to continually make money off of their so, posts. But it also almost sounds like you're, to some extent, I think there's also a correlation with the NFT aspect of it because NFTs are not just visual. I mean, sure, that's the first thing, right? NFT art is the first thing we think of, but there's also mm -hmm. NFT performances and there's also NFT music and um, NFT podcasting is coming, by the way. I'm about to be a beta tester for that awesome. um, soon. Um, it exists in some form right now, but it's clunky. And I'm working with a group that is specific to podcasting on the blockchain and um, they are getting ready to release it. And they said, we're working kind of with, they're like, Hey, you know, we're, we hope to release this in the next few weeks. I'm like, I'd love to be a beta tester. Like we'd love for you to be a beta tester. So it's a super exciting to where this can kind of be And the way that I look at it is right now, if you follow me on Twitter, every single day, I do a happy day post. I like today's Friday, I'll go out there and I'll say, happy Friday. And I'll give a weather report and then tell you what's on my mind in two minutes and 20 seconds or less, unless I feel long winded and it may go longer, but typically mm -hmm. under two, two minutes and 20 seconds, I've been doing that for, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 months. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do that as an NFT? And then people could own that day. And I thought, Hmm. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm looking at that is taking what I'm doing on web two, but then transition it to web three, where there's the value for value as part of that. Gotcha. And then um, what platforms are good for different types of content distribution or different types of content? There's a lot. I mean, if you're into pl the play to earn space, which I am getting into and my, my youngest son is all in mm -hmm. and, and his play to earn uh, wallets are pretty fat right now. Um, and I'm, I'm still learning. I play terribly. I have fun. It's I'm, I do have value. I've earned value from playing, but the play to earn space is a fascinating space. So if you wanted to do play to earn, and there's no age limit, right? Because it's a blockchain. There's nobody telling you have to be 13 years of age or older. So if you're a parent and you want your kids to, you know, do play to earn, you know, it's up to you to make that decision for them. But there's a there's a lot of blockchains. So that this blurt blog right here is just blog. That's it. You can't do anything else yet because it's new. Eventually they're expanding to doing other things. But for right now, they're starting with what's simple blogging. But there's mm -hmm. many, there's another blockchain that I'm on that has like, I don't know, a hundred and something different decentralized apps that are things like Twitter, you know, things for travel, things like Instagram, things for YouTube, things like Twitch, all that kind of stuff. And, and many, many other things in between, including play to earn type games. But then you look at things like the Wax blockchain, and that's mostly games, not all, but it's mostly games. And so it just depends on what you want. Again, this is part of that research and due diligence aspect. You just should take a look at the various blockchains to get a sense of what they ha offer and if it makes sense for you. And then once you do, you can create an account and then kind of learn whether you like the community because every community is different, very different. And I can tell you that on the blockchains that I'm on, they're, none of them are the same. They're, they're just vastly different. And so whatever's going to resonate with me or, or is my spice and flavor, I'm going to go there. And some that aren't, I'm going to spend less time there. But I am on the lookout. I'm still, you know, d in research and discovery mode myself. Well, um, just random question I put down. Can blockchain be used for physical items? Yes. Yeah. Actually, it can. So there How is does that a, work? Okay. Uh, this is something I learned about from my youngest son. Cause he's, he's, you think I'm in research mode. Oh my God. He's in research mode. <laughs> so he found out about a company and I can't think of the name right now because it just struck me as kind of crazy. It's kind of like an eBay, but on the blockchain and you can buy a physical item, but you will get an NFT of the item unless until you want that item sent to you. It proves you have ownership of that physical item. And when you want it sent to you, it can be sent to you. But in the meantime, you own the NFT of the physical item. And it's, I don't know how it works, but he explained it to me. And I'm like, that's so crazy. It just might work. So it's like yeah. NFT plus eBay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was all of my questions. Well, they were good questions. Thank really you. good questions. <laughs> Can you talk about uh, Hive? Yeah. So um, Hive is also a fork off of Steemit. Um, the 
they call it if you're in a blockchain that's that was forked from Steemit, you don't ever say the word Steemit. It's kind of like you know Voldemort, right? The he who shall not be named. This is the the legacy platform or the that other platform. People have a real strong feeling about that. I wasn't around when the chaos happened, so I'm kind of like, mm, okay, I get that that it's a, that it's a sore point for you. But what happened was Steemit was a was the 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 um, when I heard Michael Taggart talk in August of 2017, he mentioned Steemit. So I went and created an account there, wrote four blog posts, and bailed. But apparently what happened between that time and when I came back in March of 2021, um, somebody named Justin Sun, who is the founder of Tron, the Tron blockchain, came in and bought the bulk of the value of the blockchain and took it over and people didn't like the way he was taking it over and they that's why there was all these forks sorry there was all these forks of people leaving leaving there and so hive is one of the blockchains that forked off of there and hive uh, also is a place that is very much like the web 2 in my opinion um, lots going on there and it's a place where I spend time there. I spend time on Blurt, and I'm getting ready to dive into. Um, well, Jordan's actually diving into Wax, so I don't have to. I mean, there's so much going on. You cannot do all the blockchains. Here's what I recommend: divide and conquer. I would recommend getting together with folks and and identifying what it is that you like to do, and then saying, "I'm going to go investigate this one. I'm going to go investigate this one. I'm going to go investigate that one." And then coming back and finding out, because that's the best way to grow faster, is to have everybody spread out and then learn from one another. And then have some similarities, obviously, you know, so that way you can. Send out all your dogs. One of them, they'll come back with prey. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have put your, it that Your way. camera went off. Oh. Did you mean it to? Yeah. Okay. Okay, here we go. Were you going to share us something else? Yes. Yes. Let me put my trusty glasses on. Okay, so the other thing I would say, I was talking to you all about um, the blockchain, my, the, the things that I'm doing. So social media and the blockchain. I have it here on Apple Podcasts, right? It's 30 episodes. Um, they're on the blockchain, but these are not on the blockchain, right? This is Apple Podcasts. I only just this past weekend put this on Apple Podcasts because it's been living on the blockchain. It hasn't been anywhere else. But I recognize that I need to expand the folks who want to learn about demystifying the blockchain. So even though I would prefer to keep it on the blockchain or on podcasting 2.0 in order to maximize the value for value, I also recognize that the majority of the folks aren't there. So I just recently put this here. However, it's also over here um, on the podcast index. This is the thing that Adam Curry and Dave Jones are doing. This is where the value for value model works. So I am here. Now, what I want to show you here is that I have a value for value via Lightning. And right now, because it's my deal, I am the only one receiving 100% of the value. Actually, I'm receiving 99% because 1% goes to podcast index to help pay for the index. But I could, if it were for the one that, like for crypto content creators, I'll go there. Okay, and I'll, I'll look up that one. So this is a deal with Shane and I. Oh, it didn't split. Okay, I need to fix that. But this should be split between Shane and I. Uh, but this is the value for value, meaning that you can send us value for value that you receive here. But how do you do that? How do you find, how do you, you can't do it in Apple Podcasts, what we call legacy podcast listening apps. You can't do it in Spotify. You can't do it in the things you're doing. You have to go to newpodcastapps.com, newpodcastingapps.com, in order to find these podcasting apps, which have, and they'll tell you whether they support funding. So this one supports funding. This one supports funding. They also support chapters, transcripts, um, location. These also, some of them are mobile, some of them are web, some of them are Android, Windows. Find one that you like. I can tell you that right now I use Fountain. I like Fountain. I don't know why. I, I also like Podverse, but any, any one of these, you could use any of these. And people can stream you sats. And I did something, let me come over here. Let me create a new thing. I actually created a uh, com slash. I created a little video showing how to do that because again, how do you how do you learn? You educate. So here, 
this is it right here. Want to know how easy it is to jump into the value for value model to support your favorite podcasters? So I start here and I wind up going through the process and eventually somewhere. So, right. So there's fountain. There it is. There's a plugin. Let's see it come here. So now here's social media, the blockchain here, and somebody can send me here. They can send me. Yeah, it's really cool. So that's some of the stuff that can be done in podcasting 2.0. And it's, it's a fascinating space because it's building in the value for podcasters, but it's also building in the value for listeners. Because if I am at 12 minutes and 49 seconds into my podcast and you're like, holy cow, she just said something so amazing. I want to let her know. So I'm going to boost her some Satoshis and that's, and I'm going to send her a message and I'm going to get those Satoshis called a boostogram because it's a boosting of Satoshis and it's a message like a telegram. So it's called a boostogram and it says, Hey Jennifer, um, I really like that you said blah, 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 blah. Awesome. And so it tells me at the exact time that that resonated with you, how much it, it meant to you because you're providing value back to me for the value that you received. And then I get to hear directly from you what it is that you thought. So never has it been that, um, frictionless and that seamless to really, really get connected with your audience and for your audience to be, um, feel like they're a part of it. Cause what's happening is a lot of these value for value shows are starting to read. They're starting to do, um, uh, the, a section where they, of their show, where they read everybody's messages and they, and they announce who has given what. I, somebody sent a boostogram of 500 Satoshi. Somebody sent a boostogram of 2,000 Satoshis. Here's the message that they said. So this engagement, this back and forth, is helping to grow the ability and the opportunity for the mutually rewarding. Because if you're someone who sent a message, then the your favorite podcaster reads it out loud. You know, it's kind of like a fun little community thing. So there's a lot going on that the blockchain helps facilitate, and it's a rewarding system that's rewarding for everyone. Practically speaking, let's say that we want to go and instead of finding you on Apple Podcasts, we want to go follow you here. What would be entailed for us to do that? I would say go and get a um, um, one of these <laughs> one of these apps, and and then then you can subscribe to my podcast on that app. Now, each of these apps who have funding. If they have the word funding in it, that means they, they participate in the value block. Some of them take a cut, like a 5% cut or whatever, because they're, they're, they're making the transactions happen, um, which is fine because it's part of the, it's instead of, you know, Apple getting the money, right? Apple gets 30%. We know this, right? 30% Apple takes, which uh, granted they're giving us the platform. It isn't like we're not getting anything out of it. So there's the, the give and the take, but these companies are giving us the opportunity to connect and to, and to have, be in the value for value model. And they're asking for 5%, still a good deal. Happy to do it. Um, and, and what you can do is find one that you like, like I said, I use, I use fountain, but that's me. You can use whatever you want. They're all good in various ways. And then you can, you'll add to your wallet because each of these who has funding has a wallet and they, they walk you through it. Like each app will walk you through it of how to do it. And then once, and I'll give you an example, 2000 Satoshis is equal to like a dollar and it fluctuates spending on the price of Bitcoin. And a Satoshi is a fractional amount of a Bitcoin. I think it takes a hundred thousand or hundred million satoshis to equal a bitcoin probably a hundred million it's a very very tiny amount but two thousand roughly satoshis equals one us dollar so when you stream some when you boost somebody 500 sats it sounds like a lot but it's like you know it's like what is that a quarter but still i'd rather have 500 sats than nothing which on apple Podcasts, guess what i'm getting nothing but on these apps, there's the opportunity to be rewarded if I provide anything of value. You saw on Blurt that I wrote a post and no one thought it was valuable. So I earn nothing and that's okay. Not everything that any of us create is sunshine and flowers. It shouldn't be. Surely it can't be. So your community will inform you what they find of value and they will also inform you what they don't find valuable. And it's to encourage good content creation and good stewardship of the blockchain. Awesome. We are at time. Yay. Um, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Shelly. So good to see you, my friend. <laughs> well, I love you, girl. Let, let's, you let's, give them some, let's give them some next steps or things that they can do. So one of the things we could do is to go onto podcastindex.org 
slash apps slash apps and find one of these apps and that would be one way that we could baby step our way into understanding a little bit more about this the one yeah. you used is fountain mm -hmm. another thing they could do was would just be to go find uh, in apple podcast your uh social media and the blockchain series mm -hmm. and if you like me prefer to have somebody walk us through like jennifer had shane to walk her through jennifer is considering offering a workshop for it mm -hmm. so yeah, if I'm if you were interested in the workshop where somebody would jennifer would walk us through kind of setting setting up a little base camp in the blockchain <laughs> what what would they do to tell you they wanted to participate in that yeah, um, just reach out to me because it was actually this morning. I, I do a, a Twitter Spaces every Friday morning, and uh, I did a 30-part series, which is what this is over here. I did a 31-part series um, called Blockchain Creators on Twitter Spaces, and I then created a community on Twitter Spaces called Blockchain Creators, and folks have been following my journey. And so this morning when I was doing it, I had two people who said, yeah, I was part of your Blockchain Creators. And you taught me a lot, but I, I think I really need to go to the next level. I said, you know, I've been told I need to create a workshop. They're like, would you please create a workshop? And I'm like, yeah, let me put that together. Um, and I'll, you know, what the price point is, when it's going to be and all that stuff. But you'll be doing it with other folks. So it's not on your own. Remember I said that when you join the blockchain, it's better to do it with friends. It really is. And I actually, I asked Shane when I interviewed him recently, I said, Shane, you know, what's words of wisdom for folks coming out of the blockchain? And what his words were, I wish I had started with friends. It's lonely to go onto the blockchain by yourself where you don't know anybody and nobody knows you and then to build your community by yourself. But if you have friends and people to go with you, it's a much better experience. And I can tell you, based on my experience, that is very much a true thing because it was me, my son, um, and my sister and Shane, because Shane brought us on. And the four of us were learning together. Now, Shane already knew, but, and he was so great about that. So I'll say that when you give a referral to the blockchain, when he onboarded us, he gave us his referral link. And what that did is that gave, that gave him a 3% reward on everything that we create on the blockchain at any time we can remove that because again we have agency and ownership on the blockchain i don't mind leaving it on there because i am still learning so much from shane that i am getting value from him constantly so i don't mind that and i'll tell you that when i write about gaming because i my youngest son is teaching me about gaming which by the way having your kids teach you about blockchain gaming is like he's the teacher and I'm the student and it's such an interesting dynamic in our relationship and I absolutely love it. But whenever I write about gaming on the blockchain, I make him a beneficiary of that post because I wouldn't know anything if it wasn't for him. And he continues to teach me because I'm such a noob when it comes to gaming in general, let alone gaming on the blockchain. So the reward system is so frictionless and easy on the blockchain that at any given moment, you can add or take away people and add and do it at any time. And I do it all the time all the time it's it's the the real way that hat tipping should have been you know how on twitter you do a hat tip because somebody taught you something or somebody showed you something because you're giving them credit the attribution on the blockchain that actually has real world value and it's just such a wonderful thing well thank you so much for this deep dive um it, it's kind of a shallow dive actually because because the the subject itself is so deep but um we're gonna be keeping an eye on this space I think it has high relevance to those of us who create content and it behooves us who take our ownership and our copyright seriously to be learning about this. So if, if nothing else, uh, let, let's keep an eye on this space. And thank you so much for sharing with us, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to do the fire hose. If, and if, by the way, folks, if I'm speaking Klingon to you, I speak Klingon a lot. So and just know that eventually this Klingon will begin to sound like English. So you, and the only way that that can happen is by you slowly easing into the space. Okay, we'll see you next month for Fire Cat First Friday. I don't have the topic solid yet, but it'll be a good one. So <laughs> I will see you in a month, if not before. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.